Great. All right. Welcome, everyone, in the room and online to our 4 o'clock briefing today, Facing Addiction Challenges with Science-Backed Policy. We have three speakers on our briefing. Marina Pachotto, Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at Yale University. Joseph Cheer, Professor of Neurobiology and Psychiatry at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And Elizabeth Howell, Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Utah. So we'll start by hearing some remarks from our speakers, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Uh, we organized this panel because it's a moment when uh, there's so much that we know about neuroscience that is really informing how we understand addiction, but also how we treat addiction. And it's a moment when policy is changing so rapidly on every front that it made sense for us to discuss where we stand with respect to uh, nicotine, uh, cannabinoids, and opiates um, in, at the intersection between that neuroscience and that policy. So uh, in particular with nicotine, the I issue that we are facing right now is that we've switched from a huge public health success, which is the decrease in uh, combustible tobacco products, and the use has gone from probably more than 50% in most developed countries now to below 18% in the United States, and that's across the entire population, even lower among youth. And with the advent of uh, e-cigarettes, uh, smokeless tobacco products, uh, and other ways of de delivering nicotine, we now have uh, a new wave of addiction, and there's an enormous controversy about whether the uh, the vaped nicotine products are uh, a good thing, a bad thing, something that we should worry about, and in particular, how do we regulate these products? So I'm sure that you guys have all seen um, the uh, people vaping in the street. Maybe you are vapors yourselves. Uh, I have never seen a change in my neighborhood as quick as the shift from a newspaper and tobacco shops in my neighborhood to vape shops, where uh, you can see within five years, there was an enormous increase in the number of vape shops. It started out as something that was done um, online uh, with custom vape liquids. Now most of the e-cigarette companies have been brought by, bought by larger companies, many of them tobacco companies. Uh, the big issue really at the center of the controversy in many countries around uh, regulation for vaping is whether uh, the uh, advantages of having a way of taking addicted tobacco smokers and moving them to non-combustible delivery of nicotine is uh, outweighed by the fact that youth is taking up uh, vaping very, very rapidly. And the answer, of course, is that it is very, it is both, right? It is very good to take uh, adult tobacco users, tobacco smokers, and switch them to vaped products because it will decrease their harm. It is also a serious problem to expose the developing adolescent brain or the brain in utero from pregnant vapors to nicotine during a period where the receptors for nicotine are actually important for the normal development of the human brain. And that, uh, that sort of uh, interplay between uh, adults and children is very well understood by the vaping companies just as it was by the tobacco industry. Uh, because they understand that most addicted uh, individuals start as adolescents. And in particular, the products that have been most successful have been targeted at uh, developing at, at adolescents. And you can see that the uh, kinds of flavors that are uh, being used in uh, a number of, of uh, e-cigarettes are really uh, designed to appeal to non-experienced non users, so cotton candy fruit flavors, things that are associated uh, with uh, really uh, pleasurable experiences that youth have had. And that, I think, is at the center of uh, the, uh, the kinds of things that uh, we will present in the panel tomorrow, uh, which are related to how those flavors actually affect uh, reward systems in the brain, how nicotine affects the developing brain, and what kinds of policy recommendations we can make based on that uh, neuroscience. Thank you very much, Marina. And I think to to stay with that uh, train of thought that Dr. Picciotto uh, uh, started, I think in terms of the use of marijuana and its derivatives called cannabinoids, it's very clear that there's been a lot of change within the past decade. And within the past five years, we're in a state where marijuana products are legal. And uh, the the rapidity or the the magnitude of the change has been brought about from a policy standpoint, 
has actually not matched the ability of scientists to study the effects of that legalization and decriminalization. So right now, our main concern as neuroscientists is to understand the impact of these products that are being uh, marketed for a number of reasons, for a variety of uses that may not meet the criteria for FDA approval, for example. And so uh, one thing that is, that is also hindering the progress of, of us really understanding what the future consequences of using these products is, is as Dr. Picciotto said, very few people uh, know what the consequences of marijuana smoke is when it happens in utero. And again, there's a lot of misinformation about this. A lot of people, especially women, in, uh, when they become pregnant, they may think that, that smoking marijuana during pregnancy is safe because it's a plant-derived product, but so is tobacco. And so we need to be able to understand where we draw the line for, um, for understanding what the level of safety is and what is the uh, appropriate level of risk that we want to be able to handle when we're talking about either medicinal or recreational marijuana products? And so I just, if you uh, look at the screens, uh, all of us have cannabinoid receptors, all of us right now, and we're using them. Uh, the brain, mother nature, doesn't want us to evolve receptors so that we can benefit from the psychotropic effects of some weed. <laughs> So if there are receptors in our brain, it means that our own bodies make compounds that bind to those receptors. And those compounds we can target in a pharma uh, pharmacotherapeutical fashion to be able to either counter or promote the effects of those exogenous marijuana products. So we're trying to work on that. But again, the problem with, with that approach is that, I don't know if you know this, but even if you're in Washington State and you want to work at the university level with marijuana products, you cannot. You cannot go down to your uh, local shop and get marijuana. You will be uh, committing a federal offense. So in order for you to get to the point where you can actually use marijuana in your research, you need to get it from a single source in the United States, which is a farm in Mississippi. <laughs> and that farm in Mississippi is clearly not, uh, and uh, obviously it's, it's really hard, to recreate the kinds of, of levels of potency that we see with the marijuana plant nowadays. So these endogenous cannabinoids are really exciting because they, are, um, they participate in a number of, of uh, brain processes and they allow the brain to put a break to fine tune its function. So right now your brains are utilizing this system, right now, and we all have the same receptor in our brains the exact same receptor. The problem is if I were to, well, we're in Washington State, so if I were to pass a joint in this room, and let's say there's about 50 of us here, we would have 50 different subjective responses to that joint, right? Even if the receptor's the same. Because uh, the different density of that receptor, the, the, the way that the marijuana binds to the receptor depends on how many receptors we have, even though the receptor is identical. And so basically when that happens and you get these kinds of, of processes going in the brain, marijuana can disrupt that. And as and I'm, and I'm going to close with this. As Dr. Picciotto said, these processes are fundamental for brain development. These endogenous cannabinoids occur in a way that mimics development of m other major neurotransmitters such as dopamine, noradrenaline, serotonin. They allow for the brain to function. So I'm gonna talk tomorrow uh, specifically about this problem with uh, this misinformation about the perceived lack of effect of in utero exposure to marijuana, especially to THC, which is the main psychoactive component of the plant. Great. Well, thanks, both of you. And I'm going to talk tomorrow a little bit about, because it's a huge topic, but about opioids and, um, and actually what is addiction and a little bit more into the clinical side of things, but also talking specifically about opioids. Um, and obviously, we have opioid receptors in our brains. Um,
we, um, and this slide doesn't show you opioid receptors, but we have opioid receptors in our brains. Why? Because who wants to feel pain? I mean, in, we probably survived um, as a species because we could kill pain effectively naturally. But when we put in exogenous chemicals such as nicotine to the receptors for nicotine and cannabinoids to the receptors for cannabinoids or opioids to those receptors, we overwhelm the system in a way that is far, in a way, it's far above what we were ever evolved to do. So I can make my own endogenous cannabinoids and they have their effect. I can make my own endogenous opioids and they have their effect. But you put in a lot more opioids and your brain is going, what do I do with all this? So one of the things that we're going to talk about, or I will talk about tomorrow, is that is this brain disease of addiction and how it matters, and if that sounds familiar, because you uh, have a former director of AAAS, Dr. Leshner, who used to be head of NIDA, and he wrote an article in 1999 called Addiction is a Brain Disease and It Matters. And, um, and I remember when I first met him, he said, you know, I'm the only institute director that gets collared at parties and told what I need to do about the addiction epidemic. He said, you know, the national, it, it, the people who are experts in cancer or diabetes or whatever don't get collared saying, you should do this about diabetes. Everybody has an opinion about what we should do about addiction. And we'll talk some about why that might be. Um, the brain is very, um, neutral about things. The brain doesn't care if I put heroin into it or oxycodone or anything. The brain is Switzerland about these opioids, you know. It basically <laughs> says, okay, it's an opioid. I don't care. The brain doesn't care if it's legal, illegal, prescribed, not prescribed. There's no magic about heroin except it's a very effective opioid. Um, the brain just sees opioids and reacts to them. But we have some sort of these societal myths that we should be able to think about these chemicals as if they're different, and they really aren't to the brain. And one of the things we'll talk about some tomorrow is this addiction epidemic, which everybody wants to talk about the um, opioid epidemic, but we'll also talk a little bit about how a stimulant epidemic is coming right after this opioid epidemic. This is Historically, what happens? I'm not sure why, but we've seen it before. And, um, and we'll talk about the three phases of the opioid epidemic that have been identified and what led to them. And one of the things that led to this original uh, part of the opioid epidemic is tr pain treatment. Um, you know, when, as a physician, there was a time when I was told, oh, you can't prescribe too many opioids, and you have to... Cr you know, you have to treat everybody's pain completely. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not a pain specialist, so I didn't really do much of that, but I know many colleagues who went down that pathway, and we, it led to part of the, it's part of what led to our opioid epidemic today. Um, and the thing about pain that's really interesting is that many people do fine. Not as many people as the pharmaceutical companies wanted us to believe, um, they quoted an article that wasn't really an article, it was a letter to the editor that was about this long, um, saying that very few people developed addiction when they took opioids long term. Um, but actually, probably the majority of people who do take opioids long term don't develop what we understand as addiction. But, and we don't know how to predict this very well, others will have what I call the sleeping giant of addiction awakened. And when that happens, they're going to go down a pathway where their brain reacts in a very different way. It starts recruiting uh, different parts of the brain in this whole process. It happens over time. And most of the people who don't develop addiction don't think of it as this whole progression of neuroplasticity that, that I will talk about a little bit tomorrow. They think about it as the part on the left which is, oh yeah, I took opiates for pain once and I, had a l I felt a little bit sleepy or I felt a little bit high. That's not what addiction is. So we'll talk about the differences.
and we'll talk some about this whole process that the brain goes through in the development of addiction. This is a slide developed by George Kub and Nora Volkoff um, at NIAAA and NIDA, NIDA, um, and why this is a different process. So I'm going to stop there and let you guys ask questions. Okay, thank you. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring a mic to you. Kindly state your name and affiliation before your question. First one will be right here. Thanks, everybody, for a great panel. I'm Bob Wiener, former spokesman for the White House National Drug Policy Office under Barry McCaffrey, and you just gave some great presentations. I'm very concerned uh, that the media, and we're here in the green room, and that's what I do now, uh, creates myths about addiction. And right here in Washington State, and, and the use of the drugs, right here in Washington State, just recently was a, an American Automobile Association study that showed that car crashes and car crash deaths doubled to 7,000 since legalization in this state. These stories get very little press. That got a little, and then poof, forgotten, because what the media really wants to do is put it back out that drugs are safe, and marijuana's safe, and, and all that. That's where they're going, and where they always seem to want to go. So I wonder what you can recommend to get the truth into the media that these drugs are not safe. Although I'm actually taken aback uh, and, and educated by your finding, Elizabeth, that most people who use opioids, even for pain, do not get addicted. That, I think, is, if that's factual, that's very little known also. Um, and uh, so that's one thing, the, the difference between painkillers and, uh, and drugs for, um, for, uh, that get you ad addicted. What can doctors do? This is, I guess, a, the key question. What can doctors do when they are prescribing opioids to provide the pain relief but not get someone addicted? Is there better training? Is there, is there monitoring of quantities? What specifically would you recommend? And that itself will make some news. Uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> okay. um, so it's a great question. I don't know that there's a simple answer, but I think that we, the, the literature um, supports the fact, first of all, um, and I just had to do my yearly or every other year training um, to get my license for, to practice medicine, and our training was about the effectiveness of opioids and then how to prescribe them if you, if you do. And there's very little evidence that opioids are effective and safe for treating chronic pain. And most people think that they are, and there actually is much more evidence for non-addicting medications as being effective for chronic pain. Um, opioids, I really don't think I would want to go through surgery without opioids. I don't think most of you in this room would. Um, but I actually have some colleagues who are in recovery who don't do opioids for surgery. There are many different things that are being developed now that, where you can avoid using opioids. And, um, but I think what you want to do is you want to screen very well. Um, and I don't mean screening and sending people to treatment, but I mean screening for the presence of a family history of addiction, a history of uh, sexual abuse especially, um, a history of any kind of euphoric response to opioids in the past. So one of the biggest predictors that my colleagues and I talk about is if I ask all of you, well, what do you think about opioids? How would that make you feel if you took an opioid right now? Most people say, oh, I'd get real sleepy and I'd probably take a nap. My patients take an opioid and they clean the house. They get energy. It's like a stimulant for them. Anybody that tells me they have that effect of an opioid, I better either avoid them or be really, really careful with them. Um, some of our hospitals in Utah have started giving very, very limited amounts of opioids after major surgery. And they've, they've done a lot of studies within their institutions to figure out what's enough but not too much so that we don't have a lot of opioids out there on the street for, you know, somebody to come in your house and, and steal your opioids and, and that sort of thing. Um, there's also uh, more and more appreciation of how you can screen and maybe avoid starting someone on opioids, which I mentioned at the beginning. But frankly, we have a lot of really poor education in medical schools and nursing schools and 
you know, other health professional schools about addiction. And um, that's a very political thing because to get real estate in medical school <laughs> into the curriculum is really, really difficult. But most of the students understand that they will be dealing with this and they don't know what to do and they want more education about it. So there's a lot of other things we could talk about, but those are a few that I thought of. If, if I might add to compliment what Dr. Howell said, I think one of the things that people can do and in fact are doing in the states where marijuana is legal is that if you compare the window of safety of opioids compared to that of cannabinoids, is like comparing a pin in this room versus the width of the room. Okay, so you, the parts of your brain, of your nervous system that allow you to control bodily functions such as breathing and heart rate are completely enriched with opiate receptors, whereas they completely lack the cannabinoid receptor, which is found in other brain regions. And that's why it's almost impossible for you to die of marijuana intoxication, whereas you can die from opiate withdrawal, not even having the drug on board. So now what people are trying to do to answer your question specifically is in states where marijuana is legal, and in fact in other states where uh, medicinal marijuana is approved, is to really do combinations of drugs, right? So clearly opiates are very potent for pain, but the problem is their safety, when their safety of uh, therapeutic action is so narrow that you need to be able to come up with an, a coadjuvant therapy. And in most cases, this coadjuvant therapy ends up being marijuana because unlike opioids, marijuana and marijuana derivatives are actually very, very good for chronic pain, chronic inflammatory pain. Question in the front row. Hello, uh, my name is Max Kozlov. I'm a student at Brown uh, University and I'm a National Association for Science Writers travel fellow. I'm writing an article about this panel. Um, my question is this, so it seems like between the three of, of you all, um, there seems to be a link of, of marketing. Um, in the case of opioids, for example, you know, there's, a, there's been a lot of documents that have come out in recent ye um, years um, with the opioid litigation that's ongoing. Um, and it seems to me, um, you know, of course you have that in, uh, with tobacco and vaping as well. Um, now, with, with uh, the legalization of marijuana recently, um, at least in Massachusetts where it recently became legal, they've been very strict about marketing, um, like the, the stores have to be completely uh, blank, um, there can't be any kind of, um, you know, uh, sales, advertisements, things like that. So what, um, like, do you think that is kind of, what, what are some of the lessons that we've learned um, uh, from some of this marketing that has led to some of these um, public health problems and and has has the example with marijuana been a better example in terms of what mar the marketing should look like? I can probably address that because uh, maybe the poster child for marketing to children has been the tobacco industry. Uh, nicotine is really interesting in that one of the things that it does very well, people don't get super high on cigarettes, right? They feel good. Most people who smoke regularly say, oh, I like it but they don't say it explodes my brain. But what it does do, and this has been done first in rat studies and then duplicated in human studies with both smoked cigarettes and vaped nicotine, what it does is it takes things you kind of like and it makes you like them more. And indeed, all drugs take things that were previously neutral, associate them with the drug itself, so they now, uh, for example, the bar that you uh, drink in now will induce you to feel craving. It will induce you to want to drink. Uh, the place where you shoot up heroin is a place that will be very closely associated with the feeling of shooting up heroin, and therefore, if you go into that place, you will be more likely to do that. The same for smoking. Um, I don't know of studies for marijuana. It, it may be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, uh, what nicotine does is it takes things like flavors or a piece of music that you like or a meal that you just had or a sexual experience, and it makes it more pleasurable and it makes you want that thing more. Therefore, advertising is particularly designed to be enhanced by nicotine. Joe Camel was on, um, on billboards for uh, a couple reasons. One is because he was cute and he made kids feel like, hey, yeah, that seems cool. But also because there's very, very specific image that was then associated with the nicotine and that uh, when you saw him on your pack, you actually wanted to smoke more. Um, one of the things that has been uh, a real change in uh, tobacco regulation is uh, 
of course, uh, in the, I think it was the 70s, television advertising was banned uh, because it was clear that that was uh, a very uh, ubiquitous way to get, get advertisements to kids. But then beyond that, there are blank packages. Um, many countries now have only white packages because your brand is of cigarettes is more attractive to you than another brand because it is associated with your admi self-administration of nicotine. Now that's the case with Juul. Juul was simply um, uh, marketed very clearly as a very, um, it was an easy device with lovely fruit flavors. Those flavors are now regulated, and Juul has agreed to change their marketing strategy and also the, the flavors associate that, that they use. So um, what, what I think we can take away as lessons is that if you um, do the blanking out of windows and you do the blank packaging and you don't allow um, particular flavors that, like, for example, the gummy bears um, that are actually uh, associated with some pretty bad adverse consequences when kids find them and, and don't know that they have cannabinoids, I think that we then allow adults to use some of these agents therapeutically. Others will progress to addiction, of course, but we will prevent some of the uptake among teenagers and kids um, that, that might happen otherwise. The other thing to think about is the tobacco companies are really investing heavily in the cannabis industry. Mm -hmm. They're good at it. Question in the front. Dr. Howell, you predicted a uh, stimulant epidemic. Can you explain what that's going to look like? What drugs, what problems it's going to bring? And can we have your name and affiliation? Sorry, please? Tom Keenan from the Business Edge. Thank you. Um, well, so far it looks like it's going to be methamphetamine. Um, in the 80s it was more cocaine, and methamphetamine was more on the edge of maybe the West and but methamphetamine appears to be the new uh, epidemic. Um, and many of our patients who use heroin are also using methamphetamine at this point. Um, and they say, well, I can go on medications for opioids, like methadone or buprenorphine, but what do you have for methamphetamine? We don't have a lot of options for methamphetamine, uh, or really any stimulants, not just methamphetamine. So. I really worry uh, about what we're going to be doing, and I, I wish we had more tools. Another question here? Okay, the mic is coming. Well, you, you mentioned more tools. Uh, we found that advertising uh, against youth drug use actually helped the youth anti-drug campaign, media campaign, dropped drug use 30 by kids 30% in the last three years of General McCaffrey's tenure. And then people got penny wise, pound foolish, the legalizers got active and suddenly they're stopping funding and it's nuts, but that's the new policy. So, um, so what do you think about advertising as an effective tool since it really did help drop uh, smoking in California dramatically? I think that we're gonna have to use any possible tool and I think if we can show that something was effective before, then I would say let's let's try it again. I mean, I don't know that much about that information, that data, but um, you know, our whole drug epidemics are the sort of this I don't know these alternating sine waves where decreased risk perception, increased use, vice versa, and we go on and on. And um, you know, so I I think that it is um, anything we can do to show that there's increased risk is fine, but the problem is that's not gonna hit people who are already addicted. They know it's dangerous, they know it's gonna kill them. Uh, I, and, and so I'm thinking about those people. If we wanna do primary prevention, I think that's great. And those kinds of campaigns are especially effective for that, but what about my patients who are already addicted? I don't have a lot of tools for them. And again, the the promise of, of uh, exploring, at least f as, as far as I'm concerned in my field of expertise, exploring the compounds that are derived from marijuana as well as the endogenous cannabinoids is that there's, if you, anybody can look this up, uh, go to clinical trial, uh, clinicaltrials.gov, there's many, many trials for endogenous cannabinoids for disorders of motivation, such as drug addiction, gambling, for example, and the reason for that is is that 
these um, endogenous compounds uh, mediate, much like endogenous opioids, by the way, mediate the reinforcing or the rewarding effects that maintain the state of addiction via positive or negative reinforcement mechanisms uh, through a number of different ways, but they're at the core. So the idea is to be able to use these sorts of science-based approaches, especially for the populations that, that Dr. Howell talks about, and then perhaps, yes, complement that with, with uh, uh, sort of marketing strategies for these sorts of approaches. But there needs to be a lot more investment in that, in that basic uh, neuroscience approach. Okay, question in the back. So recently there have been a bunch of comments and um, some reports on the, f I don't know if you want to call it, feedback from the trying to control the opiate um, problem, but um, studies that are saying that people who actually need opiates are not getting them and that they're suffering. And I actually know of two cases where that was true in a hospital situation, um, where the protocols are put in place to protect people who might become addicted and therefore the people who wouldn't become addicted and need the pain medication aren't getting it. So how do you balance the situation so that, you know, you don't have that? I mean, it seems people have gone over to the other side, but people are suffering because of that as well. Did you want to identify yourself? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Andrea Messer from Penn State. Um, I think that's a great question because, and the, the one example I think of that's the clearest is the misapplication of the CDC guidelines that came out in, um, what, 2016, I believe. And I think part of that misapplication has happened because physicians don't feel comfortable prescribing a lot of opioids. They didn't learn much about it. Um, then they get into practice. They learn that that's a big part of what they have to do in primary care. And they don't know exactly what they're doing, and any reason or excuse to not do that, I think, is is a, a an easy way out for a lot of people. And I've I have patients all the time who come to me for uh, withdrawal, medically supervised withdrawal, who've been cut off by their physicians. Well, you know, if I cut off somebody from their insulin, that's probably going to be reported to the medical board, right? But if somebody treats pain and says, "I'm not going to treat you anymore because of whatever." and they don't try to work with them, somehow that's expected. And so I think that's part of the stigma um, that is around people who take opioids, people who are addicted to opioids, people with pain. Um, we always get really frustrated with things we don't understand. The, the CDC guidelines were never developed, just to use those as an example. They were not developed for people with acute pain, people with cancer pain, people with severe pain, they were developed when you were starting somebody on opioids for chronic pain. And somehow we can't get our heads around that. And, and so I think there have been a lot of really bad outcomes. Um, and, and so I think that it, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Um, and it, we could go on for a long time about that, but you're absolutely right. All right. I think we've reached the end of our questions, but thank you so much to our speakers for all of your insights and for your time and to the media for joining us. Uh, that's, the, that's the last briefing of the day, and it was excellent. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.